House will come to order. It's my honor and privilege for the purpose of convening a joint assembly to introduce the 52nd Lieutenant Governor of the State of Indiana, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. Members of the Joint Assembly, pursuant to Section 3 of Article 7 of the Constitution of the State of Indiana, this joint session of the two houses of the Indiana General Assembly is now convened for the purpose of hearing a message from the Chief Justice of Indiana. It is my privilege to present to you the distinguished Chief Justice of Indiana, the Honorable Loretta Rush. Welcome, welcome governor, lawmakers, judges, and I see you all up there, colleagues and friends. Did you enjoy the pictures of the problem-solving court graduations that you saw as you came in? Each one a success, each one a life change, each one a person rejoining their community. Last year, we reached the milestone of certifying Indiana's 100th problem-solving court. Thank you. Today marks the sixth occasion that I've had the high honor of standing before you to fulfill my constitutional responsibility of reporting on the state of Indiana's judiciary. In the past, I've described your judiciary as strong, thanks to our commitment to pursuing justice with energy and innovation. That is still the case. This year, I want to highlight our commitment to fighting the addictions epidemic, pursuing pretrial and criminal justice reform, and supporting and strengthening families. Because Indiana's judiciary remains committed to connecting with our communities, and because you have so willingly joined us in that collaboration, 2020 brings another report of amazing success for our state. Thank you. We know problem-solving courts work. We have many of these types of specialized courts, among them veterans, drug, mental health, domestic violence, reentry, and family recovery courts. These courts work because judges get out from behind the bench, convene, com convene with community partners, and truly connect to those standing before them that are in desperate need of a new path. Pulaski County Judge Crystal Coker developed a veterans court. Last year, after recognizing her rural community was being ravaged by methamphetamine and heroin, Judge Coker told me, I wanted a non-adversarial approach to treating the drug and mental health epidemic. And I knew we could be effective with a team approach to making our community better. It was the April certification of her problem-solving court that brought us to the 100 mark. Could Judge Coker, could you please stand and accept our thanks? Thank you. We didn't stop at certifying court number 100. In fact, with the vital support of Governor Holcomb in providing additional funding for family recovery courts, we already have 107 certified courts. In 2020, we'll see the advent of many more. Thank you, Governor Holcomb, for your unwavering commitment to this proven model of success. If there's any doubt about how our justice system serves those in need of rehabilitation, I encourage you to attend a problem-solving court graduation. Please accept this as an open invitation to go and witness for yourself the transformative nature of these courts. Montgomery County Court Judge Peggy Lohorn says a once lost soldier found his way back thanks to their veterans court. That soldier agrees with her. In 2008, Army Specialist Jonathan Bouchon was escorting a convoy of semis through Iraq when a roadside bomb exploded. While he escaped physically unharmed, he suffered from wounds that could not be seen. He says, I would get drunk, I'd go sit in a church parking lot, talk to God, 
tried to find answers. I just didn't want to be here anymore. Once he was admitted to the Veterans Treatment Court, it was still a long, difficult road, but now he wasn't traveling that road alone. In addition to the court team, General Wayne Black of the Indian National Guard stepped up to serve as Jonathan's mentor. The one suspicious soldier began to see the program as an opportunity. Today, Jonathan's enrolled in Ivy Tech Community College, studying auto mechanics. He's re reconnected with his beloved family members, including his daughter. He is proud to say he's a problem-solving court graduate. Welcome, Specialist Bouchon. Could you give us a wave? <laughs> General Black, who served as his mentor from the Army National Guard. <laughs> and what's so incredible that Jonathan is now going to be serving as a Veterans Court mentor himself to pull up those coming from behind him. And then we've got his judge, Judge Peggy Lohorn. Do we, can, we, can you give us a wave? Thank you for coming and doing the Veterans Court in Montgomery County. <laughs> Most of us will never serve in uniform, feel the stress from accompanying sacrifices, or face the horrors of war. But what we can say is that when a self-sacrificing military member falls on hard times, we have their back. In 2019, Representative Dennis Zent, as, as part of a team, um, recognized the opportunity to connect the VA to our court case management system. That legislation helps us quickly identify veterans coming through our courts so that we can, we can find the eligible Hoosier service members so that they can get the service they need. So from the 1st to the 107th, every problem-solving court has tremendous reach. Among the, along with the participants come spouses, parents, children, employers, friends, and community members. But let's put some faces to these success stories. We have a number of our Problem Solving Court graduates here today. We have their families, and we have many of our Problem Solving Court judges. We have them here, we have them down below, we have them up above. Could all our Problem Solving Court graduates, judges, and all our Problem Solving Court judges please stand and be recognized? And I was talking to some of them before this. So many of them go through it, and then they also serve as mentors as Jonathan. So problem-solving courts are only possible with strong judicial leadership, and nowhere is this leadership more apparent than the role judges have in combating the addictions epidemic. This devastating public health crisis, which has left families with heartaching loss, affects the administration of justice in courthouses throughout Indiana. The addiction epidemic is not just about criminal cases. It's also causing the removal of thousands of children from their homes, guardianship cases where grandparents are raising the next generation, divorces, evictions, foreclosures, and more. This is not a crisis any of us can solve alone. Every day is about turning the tide to reverse this catastrophe and it will take the work of all three branches of government, along with our community partners, to save lives. After three years of my co-chairing the National Judicial Opioid Task Force, three truths stand out. First, those with opioid use disorder are 13 times more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. Second, the justice system is the single largest referral source to get someone to treatment. And third, the justice system must treat opioid and substance abuse disorder as chronic, treatable brain diseases and not as moral failures. Judges must better understand addiction, treatment, recovery. We already have pulled in some of Indiana's best and brightest to train our judges on the science of addiction and evidence-based treatment. 
thank you FSSA Director Dr. Jennifer Sullivan and Dr. Leslie Halvershorn for providing large doses of judicial education. Together, we form a strong alliance combating the addictions epidemic. Thank you, Leslie. This epidemic, in no small part, has caused our jail populations to increase and is one more very pressing reason to examine and reform how we do business in our criminal justice system. Under criminal justice and pretrial reform, lower risk offenders should be released without having to post bail. Our court should, be, should make use of all available information, including evidence-based risk assessments to ensure that fairness prevails for all Hoosiers, regardless of wealth, geography, race, or gender. This conversation goes to the heart of our Hoosier values, a continuation of the same reform Hoosiers aspired to nearly two centuries ago. During the 1850 Indiana Constitutional Convention, Delegate Phineas Kent spoke of the present bail system as being very expensive and operating with great hardship. Delegate Henry Thornton condemned the practice of, face of acting upon the presumption of guilt and refusing bail. We are in good company today by engaging in thoughtful conversations among all branches as to how we implement fairness while preserving public safety. Not a single one of us wants to release a dangerous person into the community. We all want to live in safe communities. <laughs> to this end, last October, almost 800 justice partners from across Indiana convened to reform our state's pretrial release procedures. Judges, sheriffs, prosecutors, public defenders, medical providers, elected officials, probation officers, and others joined together to work on criminal justice reform in their communities. Representative Greg Sturwald opened the session by stating he could think of no more important work being done in Indiana. Representative Sturwald, just as we pay deference to the delegates who crafted this constitutional framework, history will also remember your dedication to providing solutions to fulfill that promise of justice in Indiana. Could you stand, Representative Sturwald? collaboration is the only way to make progress on this issue. Here's just one example. In Martin County, Judge Lynn Ellis formed the Martin County Justice Coalition. There, justice leaders meet regularly to discuss pretrial reform in their county. They've developed a pretrial release matrix and are building a system that meets their own county culture. As Judge Ellis puts it, our coalition's ability to work together is paramount to achieving the goals set forth in pretrial reform. reform. These convenings and conversations are happening in counties throughout Indiana. Could the Martin County Justice Coalition please stand and accept our thanks? As we work together on reform, we must address the reality that state incarceration rates have skyrocketed. For many nonviolent offenders, we've failed to address their underlying issues of substance abuse and mental illness. Some people need to be incarcerated. More people just need help. A strong justice system must do both. A jail overcrowding task force was created to study the causes of and potential solutions for this very issue. Our own Justice Steve David chaired the group composed of all three branches of government. Representative Randy Fry called the task force an historic event which brought an eye-opening overview of this complex issue. It illustrates that by working together, we can transform the lives of incarcerated Hoosiers. Representative Fry, I agree with you. Could all the members of our jail overcrowding task force, including Representative Sturwald, Hatcher, Senators Ford, and Gaskell, please stand and accept our th thanks. Strong families are the foundation of strong communities. Our courts focus on strengthening families who are under great stress and in many instances have endured unthinkable trauma. The following programs would not exist, much less thrive without your support. 
In 2020, our Adoption Day event began with three judges and 50 children. For Adoption Day 2019, over 40 judges participated and over 300 children celebrated in joining their forever families that day. In 2013, you established our Adult Guardianship Office. As a result, we've connected with local communities and today Adult Guardianships programs are found in 49 counties serving over 800 endangered adults. In 2016, you increased CASA funding. You could not have done so at a better time. As a result, our Indiana CASA program has modernized their operations, reporting nearly a million hours of training and advocacy for children. Last year, over 4,500 volunteers served over 25,000 abused and neglected children. Families are desperate. <laughs> Thank you. Families are desperate for us to better respond to those with mental health challenges. This past year, we sent a team to a mental health summit so we can better address the underlying behavioral health issues that bring people to our courtroom. Justice Christopher Goff, Senator Jack Sandlin, Sheriff Brent Clark, Doug Hensinger, and Jay Chaudhry, thank you for your working together on this important issue. Indiana's Children's Commission, led by Director Julie Whitman, is in its seventh year and serves as a national model because all three branches are working together to promote the well-being of children. And that means tackling issues such as sex, child trafficking, teen suicide, infant mortality, vaping, school discipline, to name just a few. Now the Commission is, working to, is bringing its efforts to prevent child abuse under one umbrella in a statewide strategic framework. Will all of our dedicated Children's Commission members task force, and committee members, past and present, please stand, including Senators Bro, Ford, Holdman, Houchin, Lanin, Mesmer, and Marvan, and Representatives Cleary, Devon, Devon, McNamara, Summers, and Wright. Thank you all for your dedication to the children of Indiana. There is one glaring area where we can do better, and it's an area that will have a direct impact on children and families, but we need your help. It has to do with legal representation. I humbly ask you again to consider a request for increased legal aid funding. Our families must have reliable housing. I recently spent a morning in small claims court. This morning's docket, and this was just the morning docket, had 275 eviction cases. None of the defendant tenants had representation, not one. They all face the judge and opposing lawyer alone. This is not the model of a legal system where the poor, disadvantaged, and vulnerable are protected. In making this request for help, we're not passing off a problem. We're already doing a great deal to ensure courts are open and fair to all. The Coalition for Court Access continues to advance IndianaLegalHelp.org to provide self-help forms and connections to legal service providers. Last year, Indiana lawyers contributed nearly half a million hours of volunteer legal services. And Indiana law students are embracing a public service mindset. These budding lawyers last year logged 100,000 volunteer hours. Some of our Indiana law deans, including Andrew Klein and Austin Pierce, are here today. Please accept our gratitude for your foresight and dedication in instilling the core values of public service and volunteerism and access to justice in our next generation. Thank you, Dean Klein and Dean Parrish. We continue to modernize our courts by strategically leveraging technology. Want an example? We've gone paperless. E-filing is occurring in every county with over half a million documents being filed electronically each month. In the words of attorney and Senator Mike Young, where are you, Mike? Electronic filing is a greatest event in the profession in my lifetime. Did I get that right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Clerks, judges, and staff have done enormous work to make this cost and time-saving process a reality. Our state case management system is operating in almost 80 counties. We expect the remaining of the counties to be on board by the ne end of next year. Free, online, public access to court cases is available through mycase.ion.gov with more than 27 million visits a year. Courts can now send text messages to defendants in criminal case reminding them of their next court hearing. 
One very foresighted, persevering, and pioneering member of our court led the charge to embrace court technology. Would former justice and now pr Professor Frank Sullivan please stand and accept our thanks. Justice Sullivan, if you can think of another advancement so we can top Senator Young's list, could you text me? <laughs> These many judicial branch successes cannot cause us to become complacent. We must be vigilant in driving ourselves and each other to great success, greater successes and dreams of what may be possible. In 1903, two brothers with Indiana roots engineered a machine to go airborne. Yes, the plane only flew a few seconds, 10 feet off the ground, about the distance from here over to the Senate chamber. But the Wright brothers proved that what was once considered impossible was possible and filled, filled the dream of flight. To release the potential of Indiana's judiciary, we created the Innovation Initiative. This Hoosier Justice Systems think tank is not accepting the status quo and strives to follow that Wright brothers example. We are already national leaders in justice reform areas such as evidence-based decision making, pretrial release, juvenile justice, problem solving and commercial courts along with court technology but opportunities must be sought to make Indiana's system of justice more efficient, less expensive, and easier to navigate, while ensuring, we're continuing to ensure that justice is fairly administered and the rights of all litigants are protected. I look forward to keeping you informed and updated on this. We thank all of our innovation initiative leaders, including Senator Cook. Thank you. Staying connected with our communities is a priority of our judges and judiciary. Our judges regularly take time to provide law-related civics education to thousands of students and different community members through Constitution Day, Mock Trial, Statehood Day, We the People, and other civic engagements. Our 15-member Court of Appeals has made civic engagement a cornerstone of their outreach. Like the early pioneering judges who traveled the circuit taking the court to the people, our Court of Appeals has now held oral argument in every single one of our 92 counties. Amazing. <laughs> Their Appeals on Wheels program, which has built relationships in over 500 communities, provides students at high schools and colleges and law schools, guests at tourist sites, and even retirement home residents an opportunity to get up close and personal with their government. The power of taking the court to the people left one Washington High School student, Macy Brandenburg in awe. She says, it's such an odd thing to see something so important in our high school. Like, this is a big deal. This isn't something a lot of people get to experience. Yes, Macy, it is a big deal. The value of making these community connections is incalculable. These visits put a face on our judiciary and illustrate how disputes are resolved civilly based on the rule of law. Could the hardworking, circuit-riding judges of our Court of Appeals please stand and accept our appreciation? <laughs> I have one last historical milestone I'd like to talk about today. A hundred years ago, women were finally able to vote. Last year, for the first time in history, these Indiana courts were all led by women. As Chief Justice of Indiana, I'd like to introduce you to my sister chiefs. Jane Magnus Simpson, Chief Judge, Southern District of Indiana. Teresa Springman, Chief Judge, Northern District of Indiana. Robin Moberly, Chief Judge of the U.S. Bankruptcy Court. Martha Wentworth, Indiana Tax Court. And Nancy Vadick, who just completed her second term as Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals. Ladies, Let's join us in celebrating this. Can you stand? Woo! 
So in closing, today's address is entitled Connecting, Convening, and Collaborating with Our Communities for a carefully chosen reason. Each one of us entered public service in order to make a difference. To serve whom? Our communities. And we've been around long enough to know that we can't do it alone. Let us imagine together what our courts and our state can be as we pursue justice for all Hoosiers. The framers of our Constitution divided the power of government among three separate and co-equal branches. But that separation doesn't mean we should isolate ourselves from one, another, from one another. Instead, it calls us to summon the very best in ourselves to walk that tightrope of equality without isolationism. And we're doing it, listening to one another, helping one another, working towards common goals. Our work is difficult. And even if we do it thoughtfully, with the openness and humanity it requires, there will inevitably be challenges and setbacks. But it is work that draws its sustenance from that divine spark in each of us. I commend all of you for joining us in this work. Thank you, and may God continue to bless our great state.